So I'm gonna take it to you, to your questions, and maybe we'll take um, two or three questions at a time. And if you could just um, state your name and your affiliation, and also state who the question is for, whether it's for a specific uh, panelist or if it's for um, the panel in general. Thank you. Uh, could you stand and, and introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Jeff Natash, I'm a MPH student at Jefferson up in Philadelphia. Um, my question is specifically for Lyric, but I think anyone could probably answer it. Um, so as part of the US Civil Society, you talked a lot about accountability, but what are you doing in terms of pushing the government and the UN to create sustainable programs? Okay, and another question? Yeah, I'm also an MPH student with uh, Jeff, and I'm also part of the UNA in Greater Philadelphia. Uh, you mentioned the gender um, equity um, quality, and um, I guess my question was, you know, from a male perspective, how effective are gender studies, um, especially in promoting uh, women's rights and um, uh, peace and prosperity for women? And, and what do you mean by gender studies, just to? Like in undergraduate courses and promoting. That's from an academic perspective. Academic okay. perspective right. And one more question, yes. Yeah, my name is Raji Sako uh, from UN, uh, UNA Puerto Philadelphia. I was born and raised in Sonoma, West Africa. So I understand personal experience about the, uh, the uh, inequalities of women in, in that part of the world. I cherish the ideals of, of I issues that pertain to women. Uh, there are many, many places where we can start. Where do you think that we can start in empowering women to create an uh, uh, equal society? So I'm, I'm personally optimistic on that front. 
Um, but as to the gender studies, I'd love to talk more to you after the panel, but um, I referenced to, um, the Dutch research on, on exactly this. We have a big portfolio on um, the impact of the, the, the study of gender as opposed to just women's studies or these sorts of things, and, and being able to pick this apart and say, how does measure A or program B impact men and women differently and boys and girls differently? And I can speak anecdotally as both a college student who took all of those classes and a professional working in an institute that's committed to that, uh, to that, to that exploration, that um, the, the changes are twofold. You may have a particular campaign or issue that you're looking to, to change with that conversation around gender, like uh, a, a domestic violence law or, how to, or, or something of this nature. But then you also have the way the thought process changes and the analytical skills that tease out when you broaden that conversation to include everyone and don't exclude it to be um, just you know one sex <coughs> or the other. Thanks. And we also had a question about where to start in a complex environment where there are many issues. And uh, Roma, would you like to take that question? I actually think all the three comments are interrelated. Sustainability is fundamental. Institutionalization is fundamental. But I want to take the camera for a few moments, not you, but our, our collective camera to the crisis countries themselves, out of DC and out of New York. Um, I didn't get a chance to share because of my time limit that, for example, in Burundi, uh, we have worked with national partners to increase women's political participation in post-conflict Burundi. Now, Burundi has the highest level of women in the Senate in Africa and the second highest in the world. This is in a post-conflict context. Of course, we need to think about training those who have been elected. We need to work to build national capacity of countries so that how do you run government? How do you make policies? Building an agenda that answers to the needs and interests of both men and women is long-term work, and that's why we work within the framework of democratic governance. Uh, in, in, for example, in, in Iraq, we've moved from the provision of legal aid to influencing legislation in Iraq, in the shelter policy for the Kurdistan regional government for sexual and gender-based violence survivors. We've drafted this policy, and this has undergone consultation. So we are working to embed these with the national capacity development. You can fly in and fly out, but what remains is embedding this within the policy, the institution, and so on. And in Sierra Leone, we're working very closely in women's political participation, especially with the elections. And so I think in terms of where do we start, at least we are very clear that we have three areas in which we have prioritized, and one is women's political participation, voice, economic recovery. I've been in countries where women don't have money to eat, they don't have clothes on their back, and I'm talking to them about political empowerment, and they said, Roma, please do not talk to me about human rights when I don't have money to buy a cup of coffee. So economic empowerment is fundamental to taking women's voice to the next level. And of course, without security, I mean, that's the beauty of the US National Action Plan. It states very clearly the importance of women's security being fundamental to peace. If women continue to live in insecure environments, they will not be able to contribute to the political, social, and economic life of their societies. That's bad for everybody. That's not just bad for women. So where do you start? Of course, you can't start at all places at once, but you have to work with the issues. And research, I reiterate what Lyric said and my other colleagues said, we have no data. We have real issues of research deficits. This is a huge agenda. We would welcome academia and students to work on these kind of areas. And then we're stuck with measuring. We have some, in some national team or less, we work to, in a culture of silence where women don't go out of their houses. We've enabled them to be you know, co community conflict mediators. How do you measure that change? So there is a whole research agenda there. And I think the, the, the involvement of academia is very important. Thank you. Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you. And uh, we don't want to let Sharon think we're letting the U.S. government off the hook either. So I hope that there might be some specific <laughs> questions to that. And we'll take another round. Yes, yes. Mine's actually specific to Sharon. Um, my name's Harithi. And I haven't, I haven't read the national plan covered in covers. I don't know exactly how this works. But I was thinking, I was curious about the participation aspect of it when the U.S. has really low women participation in politics, how do they make other countries <coughs> participate and they let their women participate kind of thing? And, and where is the, um, how do they correlate that issue when they're like, well, but you don't do it, so why should I? Kind of thing. Thank you, and um, we're gonna take two more questions. Yes, the gentleman. For sharing. Um, Please yeah. um, just introduce yourself. Sharon Mayo from Bucks County, Chapter UNA. Uh, we have a conflict in Syria where we seem to have a stalemate. Mm -hmm. And, you know, rather than fighting one side with arms or the other side, how about the women getting involved? And uh, maybe they can sort this out. And uh, you talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> and over here, and don't worry, we'll get to the others too. Yeah. Uh, Karen Mulhauser with the National Capital Area. First of all, I want to say Sarah is one of our board members. <laughs> that got into her, her introduction, so we're proud of that. But um, I just wanted to, to point out that it's, it's exceedingly rare that a member of U.S. government will say with a smile, we look forward to the civil society holding us accountable. And she said that, it's on record. <laughs> <laughs> so we will. <laughs> um, and I, I also, uh, it's, all, it's kind of like a, an answer instead of a question to one of the earlier questions. Uh, there is a subgroup of the civil society working group that is uh, working on, uh, with members of Congress on legislation. So in terms of holding accountable, and I want to put this in the context of our national action plan came as a result of an executive order, mm -hmm. which uh, makes it a little bit stronger than just saying, it, would, it, wouldn't it be a good idea if? And so uh, there, there will be legislation that's in the process of being drafted and that gives uh, UNA uh, a, a, a legislative hook to do some advocacy work. And I also want to point out that one of our leaders here, Tanisha, has uh, started something called UNA Women that will uh, be able to be a, a vehicle for doing uh, advocacy around women's uh, issues like 1345. Thanks, Karen. I just am going to repeat the two questions and um, just restate a bit. Uh, Karen's comment so we can all hear it again. So the first question is about what about participation of women in, in the U.S. domestic context and, and how, how do we do that with other countries when we're still kind of working on it ourselves. Um, the second question was how do we address the Syria stalemate. Um, and then also um, to just Karen's point as well about um, the interplay between civil society and U.S. government um, on this issue. and. Um, her comment about the executive order just made me want to point out too that there were others in the White House in addition to Rob who were very important to the executive order such as Samantha Power who wrote the wonderful book on, on genocide and deals with all kinds of multilateral issues in her portfolio. So, um, so Sharon, maybe you want to answer that and then we'll just um, take another round of questions. On, on the issue of political participation, Okay, first the disclaimer. Okay. Uh, the National Action Plan, the, the actions in the National Action Plan are directed primarily outwards, except for the institutionalization. So they, they will be like on participation, it basically says that we will work with women in conflict affected countries, you know, to provide them training so they can you know, participate in political life and economic life. So, so most of the actions are directed outward. However, there is a part in the National Action Plan that does say that we will try to have, you know, delegations and uh, when we're when we're meeting with women to, and men to talk about participation of women, that our delegations will include women as well. So, but for the most part, like if the National Action Plan is outwards, but we we do recognize that it doesn't do a whole lot of good for like 12 men to go into the foreign ministry and say, where are the women, and they can say. I was just going to ask you that same question. So, so no, uh, the there is the Department of Defense. I have to admit, when we were talking about, uh, and, and actually when we're even writing up our agency implementation plans, 
I think the Department of Defense is actually focused more on U.S. women in the military than state or USAID is, in, is, is kind of addressing the issue of U.S. women in parliaments or at the State Department or at USAID. But, uh, but, we, but we do realize it doesn't make any sense to go in and, and uh, say, do as I say and not as I do. <clears throat> On the issue of Syria, uh, the whole issue of women involved in Arab Spring is, uh, and obviously Syria isn't quite Arab Spring, but, <clears throat> but um, we, we do realize it's still a challenge uh, uh, to make people realize, a lot of times when people are in conflict, the first thing they say was, well, think about women after we get the conflict under control. And if this is something you have to fight and say, you're not going to get the conflict under control unless women are included. But Secretary Clinton and, um, and uh, Rajiv Shah and really everyone is so engaged in trying to make sure that our ambassadors in, in the Arab countries and that all the people that we're working with realize that you cannot achieve peace or security or stability or economic growth without involving women. So we really are really trying to get women involved and it's, it's a constant message, message from the State Department to our embassies in, in North Africa and the Middle East that these are times of transition and it's really important to engage women now. This is a, a wonderful opportunity uh, to engage women. Um, Syria is obviously a case by itself. I mean, that uh, we're still in such conflict, it's not quite sure that we have a whole lot of uh, uh, leeway right now. But, but I have to admit, in, in the other Arab Spring countries, we are totally talking about the, the importance of engaging women. Thank you. We're going to take another round of questions. Hopefully, we can get a few more things in. Yes. Hi. My name is Jerry Milburn. I'm from Columbus. I'm also um, the outreach director at Noor Islamic Cultural Center in Columbus. You can imagine as a female leader at a mosque of a people of congregation that comes from 40 to 40 to 50 different countries. And my team is 99% male. Wow. You can imagine I have a pretty difficult job. It's fun, but difficult. <laughs> my question, based on all of this, is how do you help engage men and women to even participate in these types of things without the men feeling like the women are ganging up on them and without the women f being afraid that the men are gonna ostracize them. I mean, even on a personal local level as small as this, I mean, how do you do that to encourage people to get more involved in a, on a bigger scale is what we're doing here. Thank you. I saw some other hands. Yes, sorry. Hi, my name is Latrice Wilson. Um, I'm a communications program assistant with the UNA APA, National Capital Area. And um, one of my uh, questions, or just one other question, um, is um, I wanted to engage you on the whole National Action Plan. And I wanted to know what is your communications crisis plan um, being implemented, for example, like with Afghanistan? What are like the measurable objectives are you guys doing um, that will counteract with all the other countries. Um, just, you know, I just want to know if there's like a central communication crisis plan that will be implemented throughout. Thank you. And mm -hmm. the third question. Christian Morsink, uh, Philadelphia. Um, nice to the fact that I always invite both of you. You don't want to come to each other's uh, neck of the woods. Come to Philadelphia. <laughs> um, you have conversation. Um, uh, two, uh, two issues. I, I smell something of an uh, issue that is not brought to the table, it's something called structural violence. And I would like to see if you could address that in the years to come. Uh, the other issue is when we do partnership issues, um, we try to do things on the ground. We are grassroots people, we need to go to the roots. How do we translate this kind of thing into actions in our neighborhood? One of the things that we try to do with our 72 institutions of higher learning to get them involved in the academic impact program. And through that program, we could invest that this kind of material being brought to the campuses. And I would like to see if this kind of partnership discussions can be brought more out in other chapters. And so the chapters have something to do that they can implement right there in their own region. And can you just, um state for us what you mean by structural violence briefly so we know. Uh, let me not start the conversation here about structural violence other than 
that out a couple of people who started that discussion in the 60s, but let me call it class conflict. Or the fact of that the social structure of society is such that there's always conflict growing uh, between the haves and the haves not. It's beyond just gender issues per se. Let me do it in the very plain terms to say it very strict. This is a conversation of the women of the haves and not the women of the have not. And that's what I try to underscore with the idea of structural power. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think all of these questions are really very nicely interrelated, and I'm just gonna restate them briefly. Um, the first question um, from Columbus about um, working in the Islamic Center and having 99% male colleagues and how to engage men in a meaningful way that um, doesn't demean them and, and their role. And uh, your question made me immediately think of Afghanistan. And uh, I worked there uh, for several years after September 11th, and I know others on the, on the panel have too, um, which made me very happy that the second question uh, led to Afghanistan and um, a communications crisis plan or how to talk about Afghanistan and the complexities of the issues there. Um, I'm sure there are folks on this panel who would be very happy to address that. And then also the issue of structural violence and um, the have and the have nots and the, and the grassroots action and how, how can we make this a conversation not about privileged women but about women everywhere. This is a great question. So um, I know it wasn't addressed to any given person, so I'm gonna um, ask Roma to just address any of those three issues she'd like to and then we'll go across the panel. I'm extremely excited with the idea of working with the institutions of higher learning, and I would personally be very interested in engaging more on that, because as I said when I was speaking, this is not an agenda that can be shifted by any one stakeholder. You need multiple stakeholders. Regarding structural violence, I just want to uh, share with you uh, research that has come up last uh, five, six, maybe 10 years ago from Oxford University in a, center called CRIS, C-R-I-S-E, you can Google it. But they have this notion of horizontal inequalities and what they've done is a large study across the world where they found correlation between where there is political, social, and economic inequalities across social groups, socially constructed groups within a, a country they find this high correlation with civil war. So you might like to look that up. Thank you. Um, sorry. Uh, on the issue of engaging men, uh, I, I do, oh, men and women, yes. Um, <laughs> you know, I know that we've done a lot of work like in Afghanistan and other places to try to work with imams to basically say, okay, let's, it's really important for you to take a leadership role and basically let everyone know that violence against women is not part of our religion. And so we've, we've, we've done a whole lot of work trying to engage men and religious leaders to, men and boys and religious leaders, to try to say that this is in, in your interest as well. I don't know so much, I have to admit, on the domestic front, you know, because of mo most of the work that we've done has been overseas. But, um, but I, I'm not sure that I really have a lot of advice on the domestic front, but maybe someone else will as well. Um, on the issue of the, um, the central communications plan for Afghanistan, it, I, I'm so sorry, but I'm not really familiar with, with the term. It's, um, it's um, a communication crisis plan where okay. you'll have like measurable objectives and time frames and it's I know that there are plans, the, the plans that the State Department has, uh, kind of agreements working with the government of Afghanistan, are, are, do address the, the role of women. Um, with regard to having like country-specific plans in our national action plan, to tell you the truth, we've had, we've had this dialogue, this, uh, we, we have not come to any agreement yet as to whether or not our national action plans should also include country plans where we would address, you know, what the U.S. government, you know, 
all, all parts of the US government will be doing in conflict affected countries. We are still actually having that discussion within the US government as to whether or not we're going to have specific country plans for especially those countries that are uh, at the top of everyone's agenda. Okay, good, good diversity of questions. So I'll try to be brief on all of them. On the engaging men uh, piece, I think that the regardless of program or country or, or faith-based initiative or not, the, the number one thing that we, we as a, a feminist community have not always been really strong in is engaging men at all, and, and especially as allies and advocates as opposed to um, the problem. So I think that just kind of changing the tone of the discussion and giving men a platform to talk about the contributions and the unique value that they add in circles that uh, just are, are not, not accessible to female voices um, is, is huge. And that has been my experience regardless of faith-based conversations with the Imam Projects in Afghanistan a organization I used to work for had a, had a program where we had Imams who were doing, uh, you know, uh, religious edicts, saying that it's not only not okay to hurt your, you know, to hate your wife, but also that women, you know, can and 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 should feel free to participate in the economy or, or these sorts of things, and opening that platform for them to be leaders in this movement as well. Um, so I think certainly opening the platform up is is. Um, as, as not just perpetrators, not just the problem, but everyone has a sister, a mother, a daughter, a, a wife, whatever. Um, and then I would also say that domestically there are, are uh, wonderful programs like uh, Jimmy Briggs' Man Up campaign, which is uh, doing just that, engaging men and boys through um, sports and hip hop and all number of different things to, uh, to, to, to join the movement against violence against women. Um, there, the International Center for Research on Women, which is my organization, did the first uh, multi-country household study of men and boys and their concepts around gender in Brazil, India, a number of different countries to talk about what do we see as the, the role of women, the role of men, the value of women in the household and in the community and same with men. And really interesting things start to come out when you just have the conversation about, um, you know, Individuals who see violence as a child are more likely to be violent growing up. You know, taking taking into the account those sorts of uh, psychological and psychosocial impacts that that shape behavior and, and norms and attitudes. So I think that that's something the the having that conversation and backing up to um, what are the the root causes and motivations and, and and ideas that we have and and conversation does change attitudes and does change behaviors. I believe that very deeply. Um, uh, in terms of structural violence, I would say that um, I have uh, certainly working for a research institution every confidence that um, violence against women as one piece, but certainly discriminatory norms or any of these things is, is neither a have nor a have not issue. It transcends you know, ethnic group, it can transcend religion, it can transcend um, level of wealth. And that, therefore, the interventions and the conversation need to as well. And that, that is where you don't necessarily always see the, the leap from the community voices to the policy dialogues. But we need to be better as a community to, in, in including those, in including those, because there are in every community a church, you know, conversation about about violence in the home, or a, a school, an after school program about violence in the streets, or any of these things, including and beyond violence. Um, but I don't think it's a have or have not. Uh, question. One interesting story, just briefly, that I heard this morning was that um, the Korean comfort women have uh, come out and said that they would, they're going to support the Congolese rape victims if they, if, J if Japan gives them their rep reparations. These are poor women. These are women who spent years in sex, uh, sex slaves, and just have, you know, really struggled to get back on their feet. And and they're saying that you know, if I if I get reparations from the government. That I will I will send those to the women in Congo who are still who are still suffering. Um, <clears throat> finally, what you can do, um, just uh, briefly, on on one side. Just last week, we received a check for fifty dollars from the UNA, um, from a, a, a UN model UN classroom at a junior high in Alabama, uh, population sixteen thousand who was so pleased about the work we're doing on violence against women in India, and it was just this moment of 
this is such an important dialogue to be having and you have a really unique form to have it that you have 12 year olds who sent us a check for $50 and said, you know, add girls and boys. Um, so <laughs> that was really touching to me. Um, obviously every community needs resources to do this work, but there's also advocacy hooks that could be helpful. The 16 days of violence against, um, active, activism against violence against women. <laughs> why, are, why are we all so wordy in this community? Um, it takes place every November to December. It's a 16 day campaign that everyone does globally that we would love to have UNA um, collaborate with us on that if you'd like to do that. And there's uh, recommended actions in a toolkit that go out every year um, around the summer for that. So theme last year was militarism, so very, very, very relevant. Thank you, Well, As the moderator, I'm just gonna um, take the mic for a minute just to add a few comments to the last round of questions and um, particularly about in engaging men and boys. And, I, I really think that as someone deeply engaged in the community, you really have to take it deeper at multiple levels. So, for example, there's a story I love um, from when I was working in Pakistan, where every day, you know, I'm clothed, I'm pretty, like, you can't really see me at all anyway, but I was out there on the border and working with um, male police officers and male military uh, with displaced populations. And what I found is if I wanted to talk to the men, because I was sort of an unusual commodity, I would kind of gather these crowds and all of a sudden I'd be having a conversation with 10, 20, 50 people. And when I asked them questions, well, I got the same response from every single one of them. What a surprise. But when I took the time to go into their homes or to have separate conversations with them, they would give me much different and more detailed answers about what was going on with their daughters, what was going on with their wives, and talking about family and you know taking that very complex social situation and making it smaller making it personal making it digestible you're gonna just have a wealth of information there and I, I think it's a fantastic approach if you can break it down from the group to the individual level household level um, and then also I think you'd be pleased to know on the have have not structural issues that the the UN has hosted uh, listening days for um, women's groups around the world to comment on the 1325 uh, resolution and the action plans and uh, open days where anyone who wants to participate in the planning and projects um, can be involved and the US government very much to its credit is also going to have open days on the National Action Plan in U.S. embassies um, around the world. And you can imagine there's some security and structural challenges to doing so. But there is a very intentional effort to um, making sure that all voices are heard in the development of the plan. And then I would just really close by you know, going back to the point of this forum. And that is how important you are and how much you can really make a difference if you innovate and start something new like UNA Women, um, rah rah to Tanisha for getting that set up and all of you could become involved even if you're not a woman, you can exercise your rights and become engaged. And then I also really like to think about um, that old US Army poster, you know, where it says, we need you and, you know, when the U.S. was really pushing to conscript people in the military. And I think really that's what the U.N. needs. There's no U.N. conscription poster out there uh, for America. But it is what the United Nations needs and in terms of our domestic uh, perception and attitude of the U.N., um, we do need to engage people, bring people in, and um, make our friends and neighbors um, part of this wonderful process that we can all add a lot to. So thank you for being here and I hope you continue to engage as we end our panel. Thank you.